So everyone give a round of applause for Joe. All right, we're in. Well, uh, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Joseph Gabe, and today I'm going to be talking to you about smart shopping cart wheels. Uh, if this seems familiar, uh, I, two years ago, uh, my first time at DEF CON actually, I gave a presentation about when I first started my work on these. I did a little bit of early exploration and uh, uh, found some cool things you could do with them that I'll be talking about now. But uh, this talk is a continuation of that. Uh, I found a completely new brand of wheel uh, and did a good amount of reverse engineering and I'd like to take you all on that journey with me. So before I get any further, I want to give a quick disclaimer, especially because a couple of my coworkers are out in the audience here today. Uh, this is a personal project. This has all been done on my own personal time, with my own personal equipment, uh, with my own personal curiosity. Uh, none of this reflects my employer or anything I do professionally. And uh, yeah, this is just me doing my thing, trying to have some fun and learn some stuff. So what this talk is. Uh, I'm going to be taking you on the journey that I went on to reverse engineer this wheel. There's a lot of troubleshooting, there's a couple dead ends. I'm going to be pulling at some stuff that's, oh, that's neat, but it doesn't go anywhere else and that's the nature of reverse engineering. My ultimate goal with this project was to try and defeat and bypass the anti-shoplifting features that Rokitech introduces and I think I got to that point and you know, my previous talk was kind of more focused on just that. This one's going to be bringing you along on how I did it. We're going to be looking at devices for hardware, firmware, and security vulnerabilities. We're going to be playing around with debuggers and programmers like PickKits, logic analyzers like Sales, and cool software stacks like Ghidra and Audacity to do some fun stuff. We're going to instrument a shopping cart with a bunch of SDRs and go war shopping. We're going to do some old school audio freaking. What this talk isn't, this isn't leak hacking. I'm not dropping some hot new zero days. Uh, this isn't an endorsement or instructions on how to shoplift any more than the lock picking village is instructions endorsement on burglary. Uh, you know, we're hackers, we talk a lot about security systems and how to defeat and bypass them and a lot of times that's a purely academic and intellectual exercise and this is what this was for me and uh, yeah, at the end of this I'm going to show you how to defeat the security system, you know, use, use that power responsibly. And also this isn't going to be a 100% definitive teardown of how this system works. This is reverse engineering, you know, it was limited in scope. I probably got some things wrong and if there's any Rokitech engineers out there listening to this, you'd be like, oh no, we didn't do that at all, you got that wrong. And yeah, that's the nature of the beast. But at the end of the day, I, I figured I had to walk out of a shopping center with a, out the cart locking up and I consider that a victory. So who am I? Uh, I'm a hacker, I'm a robotics engineer. I don't know why that's cut off for some reason, but uh, in my previous life I was a robotics engineer. Uh, uh, I worked in a lot of startups uh, with embedded systems and electronics. Uh, I jump out of airplanes for fun, I freak shopping carts, and uh, I really question, has anyone ever seen the other side of the moon? <laughs> and who I'm not. I'm not an expert at some of these things. I'm not a binary reverse engineering expert. You know, I do pull some code off of uh, the microcontroller and I do open it up in Ghidra and look at it. It's pretty basic so there isn't a whole lot to do there. You know, maybe someone with a sharper eye than me could see some stuff that I missed, but that wasn't instrumental to getting to the end result, but I still think that's an important part of the journey to look at. I'm also not a radio engineer or an electrical engineer and there's equally some stuff I missed there. And again, I'm also probably not 100% correct here, so if you see anything that I missed or I said anything that's completely wrong, you know, I've got my email address at the end of this, shoot me an email, I'd, I'd love to learn stuff. So I talked about how two years ago I, I talked about these wheels and I want to give a super quick recap. So for those of you who aren't familiar with security wheels on shopping carts, they're basically a wheel, they're usually on either one or two of the wheels on a shopping cart and they have some mechanism that can lock and unlock the wheel to immobilize the cart. Uh, usually these are used to prevent, you know, shopping carts from walking off in urban areas where they're connected directly to sidewalks, but uh, some companies advertise that you can have anti-shoplifting features, you know, make sure somebody went through the checkout lane before exiting the store, otherwise it'll lock. And that's one of the big things Rokitech advertises and that we'll be looking at. Uh, there's two main players in this system, uh, Gatekeeper Systems, and I've seen them all across the country. Uh, and then Rokitech, which is a smaller player that I've only seen in one place, we'll talk about that in a second, but they have 
some major commonalities. The big one is that they have a buried perimeter wire that's broadcasting a radio signal at a very low frequency, uh, usually around 10 kilohertz, and that's a big pain to transmit at. We'll get into that later, but uh, it's, it's very similar to those invisible fence systems you'll see for like dogs. Uh, they can receive lock and unlock commands at these ultra low frequency bands, as well as some of them have capabilities of receiving some commands at 2.4 gigahertz, which is a much friendlier band to broadcast at. So they have some locking mechanisms. Uh, these are both two gatekeeper systems wheels, two different styles. One of them has a internal wheel that will expand and lock the wheel like a clutch, and the other one has a plastic piece that's spring-loaded and will come down and cover the wheel and prevent it from rolling forward. And their Rokitech has a slightly different one. We'll get into that during the mechanical teardown. But uh, this is a picture of the buried wire system that you'll actually see in the parking lots. Uh, a store nearby me was having their parking lot and sidewalk redone, and uh, this wire was nice and exposed for me to uh, look at and play with, so that was uh, pretty fortuitous. But this is what it actually looks like, you know, underneath that seam you'll see in the parking lot. Or inside supermarkets, you'll sometimes see them integrated directly underneath, like, the tile, uh, you know, for, like, the per check system. And last, this is, this is the real fun part of the last talk, is the methods I used to capture these signals. So these signals are in the tens of kilohertz range. That's ultra low frequency. You know, anything that we normally deal with is almost always going to be over at least a megahertz. So that's a couple orders of magnitude lower than we're used to dealing with. And it gets weird dealing with that. But one of the uh, interesting things we'll notice is uh, 10 kilohertz is in the audio range. If that were sound waves, we'd be able to hear it. So we need some sort of electronics. We need some device to convert the radio waves into electronic signals, and then something that can deal with 10 kilohertz electronic signals. I don't know, like an audio amplifier. So uh, to do this, I made a loop stick antenna, which is a pretty basic kind of antenna. They're not very good at transmitting, but they're okay at receiving. And uh, it's a ferrite core and some enamel wire, both you can grab them off Amazon, put it into a cordless drill and uh, put on some Netflix and just wind the antenna. You know, the more loops you have, the more pickup you're going to get. Uh, you have to do a little bit of balancing for the uh, uh, impedance matching and whatnot, but you can find a ham radio handbook if you really want to uh, dive deep into that math. And uh, you take this and you solder it to a headphone jack. Uh, you'll see there's a little resistor that's hooked up there, and what that does is it actually convinces your phone or audio device that instead of a headphone jack, it's a microphone jack. So you can use this to record. So I had to dig through my old electronics bin to find a phone that actually had a headphone jack. Anyone remember those? Uh, but eventually I found one, and uh, this is the method that I was using to capture the ultra-low frequency signals. And we'll talk about how to uh, broadcast at those later. So I mentioned there's a new kind of wheel, and that's Rokitech. Uh, how I came across this involves a funny story with my dad. Uh, so my dad's a weird guy, as you can imagine, if you know me, uh, and he loves collecting curios. He, he recently retired, so he's had a lot of time to scour eBay and local garage sales, and uh, this, is, this is his workshop, and uh, you can see all the fun stuff he has. And yes, that is a functional phone booth in the back. He's got three of them. Uh, and he, no, he doesn't realize how cool that would make him here. He, this is completely unrelated to hacking. He just thinks they're cool, and I love him for that. Uh, but anyway, so one day I get a call from my dad. Hey, Joe, uh, I got one of those shopping carts that has the smart wheel, but it's locked. Any chance you could help me unlock it? And I'm like, yeah, sure, this is my thing, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I head up to my parents' house in the garage, and I, he, he not only has the wheel, he has the whole cart attached to it, uh, which... I, I don't ask where he gets these things, and I, I think it's better that way, but uh, I take a look at the wheel, and lo and behold, it's one I've never seen before. Uh, and no wonder, you know, he's trying to use the website that has the little buttons to unlock it, and it wasn't working, and he was wondering why. Was, well, of course, because I haven't seen this before. So I uh, go and look it up, and uh, that's how I discovered Rokitech. So this is what the wheel looks like, and you can see uh, some of their marking material. This was actually, I took this from a store, a grocery store near my house. Uh, you know, Rokitech focuses a lot more heavily on the anti-shoplifting angle in their technology than Gatekeeper Systems, which is more about retaining your carts on property. Uh, so just slight different uh, uh, approaches, but Gatekeeper Systems does also advertise that they have a similar system to what we're going to talk about, but I haven't ever seen it used. 
So now my curiosity was piqued, and also I had to unlock this cart for my dad. Uh, so I needed to do some research. There's a couple great wells of information I go to when I'm trying to do OSINT, and uh, so publicly inf publicly available information, uh, FCC filings, always a huge gold mine. If you have anything that's going to be broadcasting, receiving, anything with radio stuff, you have to disclose a huge amount of information to the FCC about you know, the frequencies, the bands, and usually it's easier just to include like the whole instruction manual because it's going to have all the info they want. You know, if you care about security, you can you know, carefully redact it and only have what you need, but in this case, Rokitech had quite a bit of information. Uh, what you can also look at is patent information. You know, a lot of times there's very technical descriptions of how systems work because that's what a patent is. Uh, and in return for that disclosure, you get protection. But disclosure is disclosure and that can tell us a lot. And lastly is marketing information. Companies tell us a lot about how things work when they're trying to get us to buy things. And uh, we'll talk about what we found there in the next couple slides, but uh, and then afterwards, for further research, you have to do some field research and get your hands dirty. So that's physical disassembly, taking RF captures, and some reverse engineering. So in terms of marketing material, uh, uh, this is from one of their brochures, and this looks pretty standard and doesn't seem like it has a lot, but it has a couple things that stand out. One, uh, it claims that it has an RF receiver that can up and download data. So that immediately peaked, all right, what data are they uploading? What data are they, you know, recording? Are they, because you could be tracking, all right, where is this cart going in the store? You could be tracking shopping habits, etc. cetera. Uh, so that piqued my uh, interest, and in terms of Thinking about some of the design assumptions, it's also battery powered and it lasts very long. Uh, that seems a little silly, but what that tells me is it's a sealed battery system. It's not meant to be serviced or easily replaced very often. So it's probably going to be designed and optimized around saving power rather than, say, security. Because, you know, if you're doing encryption every time you send a signal, that's a lot of CPU time. And if you only have that little unrechargeable battery, that's life. So you see a lot of design decisions and a lot of security decisions get made and eschewed for other technical design reasons, and that's a big thing that you can look at in reverse engineering. So moving on to the FCC filings, uh, so the wheel itself had a FCC ID number on it, and the first three or five letters of that are actually common to the company that makes it. So you can punch in that first five and get a list of all of the FCC filings that Rokitech has ever made. So from this, you can pivot to seeing stuff like this little box here, which is what they attach to the checkout counter, and when you, the payment goes through, it sends the signal out, and that's what tells the cart you're allowed to leave. So, this is the FCC filing for it, and I've taken out a couple snippets of it. Uh, the big part, it has uh, a couple information up above there. It talks about you know, the 2.4 gigahertz of signal, the B signal it emits, and it also talks a little bit about the test procedure. Now, this is useful for the 2.4 gigahertz, but I also found the one for the box that actually connects to the buried loop wires and sends out all of those signals. And uh, it tells us right there the exact frequency that it's using, 8.13 kilohertz. And it also tells us that there's three different 8.13 kilohertz signals, the A signal, the C signal, and the H signal. It also tells us a little bit, if the relevant shopping cart casters receive two A signals in lock, so, all right, if it gets two of those signals at a lock, that's probably the one at the entrance of it and we can start figuring out how this works. And later on, we'll turn this into a flow chart and start looking at how we can bypass it. So I've talked about loop stick antennas. I've talked about the frequency. How are we going to actually capture and process these? So we can do this in the audio frequency. We can use a loop stick antenna to capture it. And we can actually, because it just comes out as an MP3 file and those radio waves get encoded as sound, we can open up an audacity like, and just treat it as a regular sound file, and then we can play it back as a radio file. So we have all the parts we need, it's time to go war carding. So this is my little setup, I've got my laptop here, I've got a SDR to capture some of the signals, and I've got a loop stick antenna connected to my phone with a little dab of hot glue so nothing comes out, because uh, 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks did have some flaws. <laughs> uh, can't do this with Bluetooth though, sadly. But anyway, so I had this all running on an audio recorder app and I had a GQRX recording from the SDR for the uh, megahertz and gigahertz signals. And uh, 
I put this all into my war cart. And you can see the, uh, the smart wheel in the corner there and uh, just put my backpack down in there, you know, completely innocent. It's where I keep my reusable shopping bags and my reusable shopping SDRs and all the important stuff there. Uh, so what my plan was, my plan was to go into this grocery store, engineer a situation in which my cart would lock, you know, completely innocently, feign ignorance, and wait for the kind clerk to come up and with a remote unlock the cart for me and at which point I would capture a copy of that unlock signal and I'd have what I need. Uh, with the gatekeeper system, thankfully, uh, uh, I was able to buy a couple of the remotes the stores have uh, on eBay. With Roka Tech being a bit more obscure, I wasn't able to, so I had to go and find these signals a different way. So that was the method and uh, it worked. So I went in, uh, used the Coinstar machine for a bit. Oh no, I should probably get a bigger cart before I go shopping and went back to like the little cart corral area and the cart locked and the alarms went off and uh, the store clerk came rushing out, super apologetic. And I was like, no, it's okay, I promise. Uh, but anyways, I got it. So this is, you can see there's a couple different bursts, but towards the right there, that's uh, what the unlock signal was. And we're gonna clean that up a in a little bit and look at that a bit closer, but uh, as a result of this little war shopping experience, I got a good amount of signals. So I got a copy of, there's a perimeter lock signal around the parking lot itself. So if you try to take the cart out of there, the cart will just lock automatically. There's the arming lock signal, which is at the entrance of the shopping area. So you take it, bring it into the market, it gets armed, and then if you try to bring it out again, it'll lock. There's obviously the unlock signal, which can unlock a locked cart. There's a megahertz level alarm mute that can mute the alarm uh, uh, once it gets set to that IntelliBox we just saw. And then there's the per check signal. And that per check signal is what the uh, uh, a checkout counter is sending to the wheel to say, hey, it's been paid for. If you, once you get the uh, exit signal, you know, don't lock. Now, you can see here in GQRX, I did capture a copy of the 2.4 gigahertz per check signal. Uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into that for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Uh, there actually wasn't a whole lot happening at 2.4 gigahertz, but this signal is also repeated at the kilohertz frequency, and that's a lot more useful for what we're going to do, uh, both because it's paradoxically easier to transmit at kilohertz for what we're gonna do, and because a gigahertz capable SDR is slightly annoyingly expensive. You know, you have to get a hack RF and you know, it's, you, you can't get that high with the uh, real cheap SDRs. So this is what the unlock signal looks like. It's a 8.15 kilohertz tone. Uh, it looks like it's kind of broken up a little bit, but uh, in Audacity, I recreated it just from a pure tone and it was just a solid noise and that consistently unlocks the wheels. So that's, uh, that appears to be what it's listening for. The arming signal is uh, again at 8.15 kilohertz, but it's 50 millisecond length pulses at a 33% duty cycle. So it's just kind of pulsing that. And you're gonna notice uh, all of these signals are pretty basic. You know, they're either solid tones, pulses, or very basic shifts. And I'm gonna talk about this at the very end when I speculate to some of their design decisions, but I, I think this is a very intentional design because it's easy to do with low processing power. The cost is security, and that's gonna let us do some fun things later, but uh, this is the lock signal. This is a seven kilohertz pulse, 30 milliseconds with a 50% duty cycle. And then uh, this is the one that I really wanted to get, the per check signal. So you can see there's a couple things I actually uh, uh, checked out, bought a pack of gum to do it again so I could see if there was any difference you know, between subsequent ones and the answer is no. And if we uh, adjust the contrast a bit and zoom in, we can see what that looks like. Uh, it might be a little hard if you're not used to reading spectrograms, but uh, what you can see is there's a couple lines that are parallel and partway through they dip down a little bit and then go back up and that's kind of repeated like a ladder across a bunch of different frequencies. So what this is, it's a tone and I'm not sure what frequency it was originally intended to be at. Things can get a little weird with harmonics, but it's a frequency, it drops down by 250 hertz, goes back up and uh, that is the signal that it's allowed to leave. And now if I can, I actually have what that sounds like uh, if you, you know, this I was a recreation of it, so be, I cleaned it up a lot. It was very, very faint in the original audio, but if you take that pattern and you uh, retune it, it sounds like this. And that's all um, uh, it takes. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Uh, 
And that's all it takes to unlock the shopping cart. So let's get a little freaky. And for those of you uh, unfamiliar with what freaking is, it refers back to uh, uh, a famous hacker, John Draper, who figured out that you could use the toy plastic whistle in a Captain Crunch cereal box. If you played it into an old school payphone, it was the right frequency as some of the control codes and it would let you basically access admin mode. And so freaking is kind of one of those fun little, you know, using unconventional signal methods to get control that you shouldn't have. And I, I think this is adjacent enough to it where uh, uh, we can call it that. So a couple things let us do this really easily. These signals lack any sort of authentication or security. It's the same signal each time. There's no rolling code, nothing get incremented. It's the same each day. There's no time stamping. Uh, and again, this was probably done because all of those things are computationally expensive and every processor cycle takes a couple joules and you have a limited amount of those in your lifetime and you know if you can make the difference between a, year, uh, a wheel that lasts two years in the field versus one that lasts five years, that's huge from a marketing perspective. And, you know, unfortunately, a fact that's not uh, at heart to people who aren't in this room is security isn't number one. You know, there's so many other business factors that go into these design decisions, and uh, a lot of times security gets put in the wayside. You know, I don't think their threat model here was super sophisticated. I don't think they expected some random nerd to get real curious and reverse engineer it. So I think it could be forgiven, but you know, you can see the impact of other factors and design decisions into the security of a system. And you know, in my day job, when I do assessments of commercial devices, you see this a lot more and it's a lot more pronounced. You know, you can start to see corporate politics in, in security decisions. So, when we're talking about freaking these wheels, we need to talk briefly about what parasitic EMF is. So whenever you're putting current through a wire, you're creating a magnetic and a radio field. They're kind of the same thing. It's a whole, whole physics thing. But basically, you put current through a wire, you're creating radio waves. Uh, and normally, that's a bad thing. You know, you're putting energy into the air that's not going into the thing you want it to. And uh, in the case of a speaker coil, you know, that's energy that's radio waves, just a tiny amount, but that's not going to, you know, moving your membrane and creating sound. But in our case, since we're trying to transmit a signal at the audio range, when we play an audio file, the parasitic EMF is also in the kilohertz range. So if we play the right audio file through our speaker, at, the, at a loud enough volume and hold it next to one of these wheels, we can control the wheels and send the lock and unlock signals. And that's what we're going to be doing. So I had this successfully working with the gatekeeper systems wheels and uh, uh, the website I'm going to link to at the end uh, has buttons you can just push play for lock and unlock and it plays the little audio and you hold it up to the wheel and uh, I'll have a demo in the physical security village if uh, people want to try it themselves. But uh, I was having inconsistent results with these Rokitech wheels, and I couldn't figure out why. So I needed to go deeper, and uh, the only way to do it was physical disassembly. And I have no idea why these things were on eBay, but I am not complaining. Uh, so I got a couple samples that I could uh, uh, tear down uh, destructively if I needed to and really dive into it. So now it's time to get into reverse engineering. And uh, this is where... Uh, uh, the, the concept of scope comes in. You know, this is a hobby project. Whenever you're reverse engineering something, there's near infinite scope available. You can go as deep as you want and deep as you have time for. Uh, and when you're reverse engineering, you need to carefully select that scope. You know, there were some things that I found was a dead end and I, I you know, left them as it was. But if I wanted to, I could have gone a lot deeper. You know, there's a couple mystery chips that I was like, all right, that's what this probably is. And I could have fully traced out the PCB and made more educated guesses, but I didn't because I didn't want to and that's okay. That wasn't in the scope that I set for this project. Uh, you know, reverse engineering can be sometimes like looking at some, some footprints and trying to figure out what the person had for lunch. You know, you're looking at some weird things and trying to intuit something completely orthogonal. And if you're good, sometimes you can. And uh, it wouldn't be a presentation that I give if I didn't sneak in a Terry Pratchett quote. Uh, and I, I think this really speaks to the heart of reverse engineering is what happens to people who ask too many questions? They need answers and it serves them right. And uh, we got some answers. So I got this wheel and uh, I started tearing it down. And mechanically it, it's pretty similar to other wheels. You know, it has a battery compartment, a sealed PCB enclosure. 
uh, a sub mechanism to lock it. You know, you have a little locking latch that's controlled by a pawl, and that pawl rotates, releases that latch, and then it interferes with that uh, internal uh, wheel and prevents the wheel from spinning. Not, nothing too crazy. If we look into that sealed PCB area, we get to the circuit board, the real area of interest. So we've got that inductor, uh, you know, that's going to be the kilohertz antenna. It's basically the loop stick antenna that I made, except it has much better amplifier equipment designed by a real engineer. Uh, we see that underneath it, there is a missing chip footprint. That's going to be a lot of fun in a couple seconds. Uh, we see the main microcontroller, a PIC, a PIC 18 F23 K20. Uh, of note is this chip doesn't have 2.4 gigahertz capability. Uh, so the 2.4 gigahertz capability they're advertising is kind of curious since they need some sort of transceiver unless they're doing something really, really basic and weird with raw signal. But we see there's a header that will later turn out to be a programming header and we have some wires that connect to the battery connector and the motor connector. Looking at the back, we have a mystery chip. That's going to be fun. Uh, it's just labeled N100B and uh, has DE4 printed on it, nothing else. Uh, and we have just a little uh, tactile sensor that's used as a limit switch so it can tell, you know, when it's in the locked or unlocked state. So now we get to use a technique that I really like using uh, uh, for tracing out PCBs, which is overlaying images. So we have the front and the back of this board and we can see that the traces jump from the front to the back and it's a pain to trace out with a multimeter and try to keep track of it. So. For smaller boards like this, uh, uh, you can sometimes do it, but even on small boards where you don't have to, I find it's really useful if you take good uh, straight on photos of the front and back, you load it up in GIMP or Photoshop and uh, mess with the transparencies and you can get a really cool overlay. And so you can kind of see where holes, where traces, where vias and everything align and what components they talk to. And from here, you can pull up the data sheet for components that you can identify and you can start tracing out all of those traces. And having that transparent image and being able to flip back and forth is super useful. So in this case, I traced out these um, uh, 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 pins and I found that that header had VPP, VDD, PGD and all of those lovely, lovely things that people who work with microcontrollers will recognize as the debug header. So the next step was to grab a debugger and see what I could find. Uh, so this is a PIC kit. Uh, it is the standard debugger for PIC microcontrollers. Uh, they're super cheap on Amazon, like 20 bucks. I got one and hooked it up. Uh, word to the wise hook up all the wires. I spent about two hours wondering why it wasn't working and I didn't have um, uh, VPP hooked up properly, so that was entirely on me. But uh, you hook it up and uh, you have to hook up little tiny uh, wires to everything. And then you get it hooked up, all of them hooked up to the uh, pick kit and you load up pick kit two minus. Uh, pick kit two plus is the premium software that has all the fancy features, but pick kit two minus is the free one that doesn't, but it has enough for me. Uh, you connect it via USB, take care of the bootloader stuff for your pick kit, select your device, go through the rigmarole, and if you're lucky, we're in. So we get a couple cool things. We can see that we've got program memory, we've got some configuration bits, and we've got EEPROM data. Now, a quick word about the configuration bits, because this is also something I see a lot in the commercial world. Uh, set your security bits. You know, microcontrollers have code protection. You can code protect it so people can't pull off the code. You can write protect it so people can't overwrite, overwrite the code you put on. You can even do external block table reads, which I have no idea what they are. Uh, and you can see what they do in the data sheet if you look up that table, and I'll save you the trouble, none of them are set on this none of the security bits are set. So that means we can pull off the, the uh, uh, code from the microcontroller and uh, open up in a reverse engineering program like Ghidra. And interestingly, there's only about two kilobytes of actual code uh, that I managed to pull off. Everything was set to uh, OXFF. Uh, it looks like it was mostly the resets and the interrupts that were set and a couple other bits of code. So I'm not an RE expert. I could be missing things. I had a couple friends who are look at it and they also agreed that there was not a lot. So based on the fact that this is a really basic microcontroller, I'm guessing the fact that it's really just handling the, you know, the limit switch for the motor, powering the motor, and then maybe doing some super basic signal processing and then firing an interrupt based on that. And, you know, maybe a couple bits for a state machine and tracking that. But it really seems like it's that basic and it's not doing uh, uh, any encryption, any data uploading or downloading or anything like that. Uh, 
And then we've got this mystery chip on the back. And we've also got that mystery footprint of an unpopulated chip. And I'll talk more about this in the speculation section, but that's probably where they'd put the 2.4 gigahertz stuff if they wanted to implement it later. But uh, from tracing it out early, I noticed that all of the pins on that mystery chip get broken out to both the main microcontroller and also that unpopulated header. And that unpopulated header makes it real easy to, well, easy to connect fly wires. Uh, this is miserable work. Uh, uh, this is my first attempt at it. I ended up having to completely redo it. But uh, you take a little 30 gauge uh, uh, wire or some uh, uh, enamel wire if you have it. You wrap it around and you solder it real tiny. Use lots of flux and a small soldering iron tip. From there, you can hook it up to a Sele logic analyzer. A logic analyzer is basically um, a, a whole bunch of, it's like an eight channel oscilloscope. You know, it's not as high resolution, but it can do some really cool stuff. And uh, run it through the boot and see what we get. And we get some, some interesting stuff. This is in digital only mode. Uh, and one thing I noticed is everything was dead until I touched the wheel. Uh, when I moved it, those lines, you see the yellow, green, and purple ones lit up. Uh, so they were sending something. And I was a little confused. Uh, so it looks like there's some sort of accelerometer and it's only listening for signals when it's in motion. Again, probably a battery saving feature, but that would explain why I was getting inconsistent results with my replay attacks because I had it on the bench top with the speaker and it wasn't moving, so it was just ignoring any signals. But looking at some of these signals, they're ide nearly identical. Uh, uh, slightly different, but why would they replicate them? So I switched it to analog mode and we see that they are very similar waveforms, but it's the antenna. I played uh, 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 a couple of the lock signals and we see those waveforms and we see on the upper traces similar modified waveforms. My theory is that they're doing their filtering in hardware. So they have passive components and they're doing their radio signal processing and a couple of their uh, uh, mathematical operations at the hardware level so they don't have to do it in the processor. You know, if they need to find the absolute value or the magnitude of it, you can do that with passives and save yourself compute time. So we, we kind of set the CLA to a mixed digital and um, uh, analog mode and got a good capture of this is the whole boot sequence. You arm it, you hit, put it the arm thing and you can see it lock and it goes to this whole thing. Uh, if you're wondering if there's any serial data there, no, there wasn't any serial on any of those lines. Uh, I think there is chip to chip communication lines there, but because that chip is unpopulated, there's just no communication happening. Uh, so with this, we can make a flow chart and that's going to help us bypass this. So we have an idea of, you know, the basic states can operate in. We have an idea of the signals it's listening for and can listen for. And uh, we can start thinking of bypasses. So I just put together a quick little flow chart of how it works. Uh, uh, one big caveat is uh, if it gets the arm signal within 30 seconds of the first one, it assumes that, you know, you brought it through and then brought it back quickly and it doesn't lock and it goes back to idle. And that's going to be important. So looking at this flowchart, we can see three possible paths to bypass this. One is, is the very obvious one where we just replay the per check signal to it and say, hey, yeah, you're okay to leave and you leave. And I've tested this in the store, you know, with an empty cart and uh, successfully been able to get the cart back out without it triggering the alarm. Uh, there's other ways too. Uh, the 30 second disarm can be exploited. So you bring it out and then you bring it up to the buried line again and then back it out and it's entered the idle state again thinking it was back into the little cart corral area, but it's actually in the store and it's not going to arm until you take it back out. Uh, and then the last one, and this is probably the most reliable since the other two give you no feedback, is to bring it through a lock cycle. So you have a lock signal and an unlock signal. You bring it into the store, you play the lock signal to force it to lock, then you play the unlock signal to force it to unlock, and then it's back in its idle state disarms because it thinks it's already been through it. And with that you have positive feedback knowing that, you know, it's working and, you know, you're not just playing a speaker sound at it and hoping it picked it up and it's not going to alarm. So those, those are the three main methods for bypassing this that I found. And now, as I promise, it's time for a quick little bit of speculation, kind of, this is me just shooting off the cuff, stuff I think they're doing or is going on uh, uh, that I'm not 100% sure on. So I mentioned 2.4 gigahertz and how they have it. Uh, their FCC documents and their marketing materials say they do, but their PCB says they doesn't. Uh, you'll notice they have 
uh, there's a little trace going around the entire perimeter for that, and those are usually used for gigahertz antennas. Uh, but you'll also notice, if we zoom in, uh, where that connects to the board, all of the passive components are depopulated. Uh, that combined with the depopulated, you know, what looks like it could be a microcontroller, I'm going to guess that they designed this to be able to, at some point, do 2.4 gigahertz, but either for design reasons, economics, or battery saving reasons, they said, hey, we can make this only work off, you know, the 8.1 kilohertz range, and we don't need to do this radio stuff. And maybe if a customer did want to do the advanced stuff and uh, be able to upload and download data, you know, they could have a revision of this that does have that built in, but... I haven't been able to find this, and I, I've gotten a handful of these wheels off eBay from all different parts of the country, and none of them that I've opened up have had uh, those chips populated or any indicator that it's doing more advanced communications. So that mystery chip on the back, that could be a, t a crappy little system on chip that's handling the 2.4 gigahertz. I imagine if it were, it would have been closer to that in those antenna traces. Uh, my honest guess is that's an accelerometer, and that's how it's actually sensing when it's in motion. Uh, a lot of accelerometers have ultra-low power modes that can send an interrupt signal when it's in motion, so you're not actually doing any communication or like reading and data processing. You're just, hey, was this in motion within the past couple seconds? And that's consistent with what I'm seeing on the logic analyzer. Uh, and the 2.4 gigahertz could probably be added later, but probably won't because that's going to use a lot of power that you don't have. Uh, I want to give a couple thanks and shout outs. Uh, first of all, to my dad for like bringing these wheels to my attention, to uh, all the DEF CON staff and goons for making this happen and for somehow letting me on stage again to talk about shopping carts. Like two years ago, you gave me a stage and I talked about shopping carts for 20 minutes. And like this year, you guys have no excuse. I told you what I was going to do. You knew what I was going to do. But you all still showed up here and uh, I'm real thankful for all of you. I'd also like to thank all of my friends and loved ones, some of whom are here, uh, some of whom are back home. Uh, and we'll see this in video. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Uh, and then just everyone who's made all of the software stack that I use this, the people who made Audacity, URH, Ghidra, thanks NSA, uh, and all the other tools, as well as just the random people on eBay who have these things for sale. I don't know how people end up with these, but that's how it goes. Uh, this is just a quick references, and uh, that's it. I'm going to have a demo in the physical security village. I'm going to go set it up right after this. Uh, where we have, I modified some wheels to be transparent so you can see what's going on inside of them. Uh, we have a website, bgaydocrime.com slash carts. It has little play buttons where you can uh, play these audio files. And uh, if you want, check us out in the Flamingo in the Physical Security Village. We've got, uh, I've got four of these wheels, some of the gatekeeper systems, two of the Rokitex, and uh, you can actually try this yourself with your phone. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, uh, happy to answer them. I'll also be around the physical security village if we run out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. This was a, a lot of fun to work on. I had a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm just real thankful to be here and that you all let me talk about shopping carts to you for so long. <laughs> right. Any questions? Bueller? Bueller? All right. Well, thank you, folks. Have a good one. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to grab me after the talk. I've got pretty distinctive hair. All right. Have a good one, folks.